Good evening, and thank you for um, having us here. So I am currently the Corporate Director of Protection and Prevention and Education Leader for Health Safe Health Alliance. And we are a 13 hospital uh, healthcare organization, highly integrated healthcare organization in Northeast and Southwest Virginia. And we also have multiple uh, affiliate clinics and, and ambulatory care um, organizations included. As the Director of Protection and Prevention, I design, maintain, deploy a uh, patient safety program. Um, each year, the infection prevention staff, um, including 19 infectious infection preventionists and an analysts, um, get together to perform a risk assessment and a evaluation of current year's program plans, and then we develop a new plan and, um, and work throughout the rest of the year to implement that program plan um, with the goal of preventing transmission of In addition, I'm serving as the Inpatient and Wound Care Director, um, which is quite a different role than an Infection Prevention Director. Um, but I have a team of highly skilled wound care nurses that work to not only treat patients with wounds and ostomies, but also to prevent hospital bar pressure ulcers and, and other issues related to, um, to wound care. Good afternoon. I'm glad to all came today. Uh, my name is Jamie Colton. I work for the state of Tennessee. My department is Environment and Conservation, kind of a long name, but we basically do the environmental and regulatory agency for the state, and the conservation side includes all 54 of our state parks. Actually, 55, we added a uh, rocky port. Y'all have to see on the news recently. So um, that, that was my department. We have, we have a, a large department, as you can imagine. Um, I was recently chosen in April to manage the Office of Sustainable Practices, our program of sustainable communities. So I'm working on that, although they didn't make me move to Nashville, which I was very glad. So getting to do that here was a, was a great honor um, and a lot of trust that they put in, in, in my work to let me do that from here. Um, one of the things we've been working on, um, our Office of Sustainable Practices was formed in April of this year, and it comes from a large um, it survey that was done by the state, top to bottom review. And with that top to bottom review, they realized that our Department of Environment could do more to, to walk the walk and be more environmentally friendly. Like your pretty little uh, recycling bin and everything you have on campus, which is just awesome. So what I do with uh, the Office of Sustainable Practices, our sustainable community portion, we go out and try to recognize folks like ESU that are doing such a great job uh, being a, a sustainable campus. Not only the environmental efforts, but that also includes health, social, and just the overall uh, wellness of a community. Um, so I'm really doing a lot more health aspects than I have done previously. Previously, it's mostly just environmental. So our main thing is trying to communicate. One of my um, things I have been doing recently, other than retooling our website, and pretty much starting from scratch, um, I've been trying to write some articles such as this one I brought here. If you want to pass it around, it's uh, an article from Athens, Tennessee, that some of my staff wrote, Jake and I some of the wetlands work they've been doing. So uh, my goal, and hopefully I'll get to write something I need to get you here pretty soon too, but my goal is letting the state of Tennessee knows that we have some home community down there and I hope to continue to build on that. One of the uh, things I did want to mention and mention to the health folks earlier is one of our programs is the pharmaceutical bins. We're working on having at least one pharmaceutical bin for um, unused medication uh, for every county in the state. So we are um, about a third of the way into that. We have several in our area. And with one of the main problems right now, the prescription drug use, we have to continue on that effort. Thanks for having us tonight. Good evening. I know a lot of you guys. I feel very comfortable, almost like I'm just sitting around talking over in the dean's office. So this is great. So, like Christian said, my name is Paula Masters, and I work for Life Pack, the Public Health Training Center, located here at East Tennessee State University, the College of Public Health. And Jan thought she had a long name, but I think I, I think I'll win on that one. Is that LIFI actually stands for the Long Distance Internet Facilitated Educational Path for Fly Training Now. Can you guys say it? <laughs> All right. Um, so what that really means is that the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Department of Health and Human Services, they 
saw a need for public health training across the entire nation. And with that, they allocated money to begin public health training centers to get the public health training workforce where they needed to be to be most competent to provide services to build the health and increase the health of everyone across the nation. And so that's why the public health training center exists. That's why I exist. So Dr. Rob Pack started, um, he actually applied for the grant through HRSA and got it and we're one of 37 across the nation. And it's incredible. And so I oversee the day-to-day -day operations of that center. What does that mean? What does an everyday look like for life path? Well, what it looks like is a multi-pronged approach to training for Tennessee and Southwest Virginia for those public health professionals. And that means that we offer academic training for them. And we do that through provision of site money to try to alleviate a barrier that once existed to coming back into formal education by providing cost of living site. We also provide non-academic training, so continue education. We do that through symposia and online training and workshops. We also handle the needs assessment for the workforce here at the Public Health Workforce in Tennessee. We just got through completing that. So we surveyed almost 5,200 people in the state of Tennessee that were working in public health to really see where their needs were, where their competency levels are. We do a field scholar program in that we try to attract public health students to do their field placements in medically underserved areas. And we do that providing excitement. So again, alleviating that financial barrier that sometimes fits where those areas don't get students like you guys. Um, so that's what it looks like. Christian really wanted us to talk not so much about the organization, but what we do, what our roles and responsibilities. So I just want to talk a little bit about that in that, um, and I hope that we're, we'll round it out when we talk about what we want to see from you guys coming into the workforce. So um, some of the things that I do is a lot of um, taking those express needs or those direct requests that I get from public health people and putting that and playing that programmatically in a way that will best fill that need. And so that takes um, knowing those theories that we all learn as students. Um, so taking those and being able to get a group together and really formalize programs and launch those. Um, other things is managing people. So I do a lot of public relations and promotion across the state and being able to garner support and develop relationships that best serve public health in Tennessee. That's one of my main responsibilities. And so I have great partners with the University of Tennessee and also my Mary Medical College University of Memphis, Tennessee Department of Health, and the Tennessee Public Health Association. So those are two of the big things that I do. And then the other one is just really being able to communicate between students and public health professionals and the college and serve as a liaison between those entities to um, match needs of all of those to best serve Tennessee's public health. I'm Erin Burnside, and as Christian said, I'm in microbiology departments is a little bit different than public health, so I'll talk a little bit about how applying what I learned in the microbiology degree program and how I'm going to apply that to help the public. Um, I'm a research scientist at Western Carolina University, so my main job function is research, specifically to study challenging example types and then apply those to see how we can help the public by helping solve crimes and also mass disaster, missing persons, those kinds of um, we look at bones, teeth, hair samples, some challenge sample types where you're not going to get a lot of DNA. And we're also evaluating what's the next generation sequencers and looking at these sequencing platforms to see how we can gather more information from DNA molecules to better sort out mixtures that you may encounter in a sexual assault type of case. Um, other than the research, I'll also help guide graduate student and undergraduate student research projects. Um, I teach forensic biology lab and statistical methods and forensic science and also seminar class in forensic science. And then I also help write grant proposals for our lab. Um, purchasing of reagents and chemicals to lab and some of those day-to-day -day equipment type and things work on service contracts. So I do a little bit of everything in our lab. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to get into the tough so, um, in the current economic climate, um, what is your best advice for job seekers? 
to study public for interesting errors about this of mine. And, and I thought I had a cool job. You guys have probably gotten a lot of advice already on moving out to the job market. And um, the advice I have to give you is probably more practical than it is anything that, um, you know, cer certainly no revelations here. Um, we get, uh, I'm hiring for four positions right now, and when I get resumes in, um, I have a tendency to skim them personally. I look through them quickly, make sure that everything that really needs to be um, but if I find a grammatical error, that's a big point in it. <laughs> you know, that, that really does make a bad impression. Um, and then really everything else is, is about the interview process for me. And you know, it's certainly not that way in every field, but when you're in an environment like protection prevention where I've got you know, a group of mostly women that are going to spend a lot of time together and there's a huge social component, folks that have to uh, work with their managers and physicians and so on, um, there's, there's a very large social component. So the interview really does matter. Um, some of the things that I've seen on interviews recently that I would discourage um, would be chewing gum, showing a plate, using your cell phone, um, inappropriate clothing, or having lots of information on Facebook that you probably don't want somebody else to get. Because the, I actually have a gal all of this, and that's her role when we're hiring a candidate, she searches them out on Facebook. And she lets us know if there's someone that we want to hire or not. So, um, again, those are all very practical solutions. I'm sure these guys are going to offer something really insightful. But, you know. That's actually great. And I have, I have some of my communication techniques in a later uh, question, though. And um, what I put for this one was um, I feel that, and Dr. Whitehall said it's time to do this, but I said, I said, I feel that being trained and cross trained with many job functions and skills as possible will solidify your application and it may help whether you're trying to get a position or maintain a position with, when you do get employment. Uh, anytime you can see, there's a lot of even free training out there. There's webinars, there's classes, and I work for the state, they actually take you to take one class a semester. So I actually got my master's while working. And I was able to do that through that program. So it was a great blessing for me to be able to um, get more schooling while I was there. But I can tell you, I'm a little older than some of the folks up here. In the last 15 to 20 years, look how the computer has taken off. And you all, you've always been around the computer. But I can tell you, 15, 20 years ago, not many people even had a TV. Not, not anybody had anything on their phone that they could pull up. And, and, and most of the cell phones were this size. So uh, it's just amazing what has changed in 15 to 20 years. So I think keeping up the software and that arena would be great. I can't only really imagine what you guys are going to see in your lifetime. So just staying current. And uh, the second thing is just what I said, staying current on what is happening. You can uh, look at social media. Some things uh, are declining in views. Some things are gaining. Uh, watch what you put on there. Like, like uh, Rebecca said, and then um, also get newsletters for your trade and your field. You can learn and stay current in the news and uh, different publications. I can't uh, stress to you enough how important it is to be read up and current because in an interview, somebody might say, well, what do you think about this situation? Because they like to ask you questions that are just off the cuff. So they can tell by that if, there's, if you're a student that, and an employee that stays current and looks at all the changes in the health field, the psychopathology health field in general changes a lot. So um, those are my recommendations for you guys. Uh, number one, I'm gonna use microphone. Um, <laughs> when, when I saw this question, the thing that I thought about first off was to be flexible. And when I say that, I mean that right now because of the economic climate and the way that it is, is you may not be able to go straight in with a bachelor's degree and be a manager in public health or in the health department, and that's okay. I think that one of the biggest things that um, you need to realize is to be flexible in that because of the limited jobs, that you may have to go into something that is not what you thought you were going to go into. And that's okay because you can still learn. You can still gain new skills that are appropriate and relevant to be used in your next 
job. And I actually did that. Um, when I first graduated with my bachelor's, there were not that many public health jobs. Now granted, I was wanting to stay in the area, but there still was not that many public health jobs. So I actually took a job working for the contract company with the hospital. The best thing I ever did, because I got to see firsthand patient care, I got to see public health, really, I got to see public health approaches, and it's relative, I can't even think of the word that I'm talking about, but I saw how public health could actually be better through that, and I was able to take that and get that next job. Secondly, besides being flexible, is personal contacts. When you're looking for a job, it is much better than to just be able for someone to look at your name on a piece of paper for them to actually know who you are. So I, uh, I get calls all the time of that of people applying for a job, looking for a job. First thing I ask them is, have you made contact with the hiring manager? As in, have you dropped by? Have you met, have you went out in those places that you would like to see yourself in a job? Do they know your name? Have you gone to just an open meeting that they tell the public? Most organizations hold some sort of event that's open to the public that you can go to and get your name out there. So be flexible and let people know who you are and what you have to offer, and then follow it up with applying for jobs. I think my advice would be similar to what Paul was saying, to echo a little bit what she was saying about being flexible. That's a really good thing to do. I did the same thing, and I think a lot of the students that I have at Western Carolina, they, they get close to graduating, and they think that they need to know exactly what they want to do, they want to have their perfect job right off the bat, and they, they really stress themselves out with it, you know, wanting to find that perfect job and not wanting to settle. But because of the economy, it can be very difficult to do that. There's a lot of many jobs out there that are available, and you may have to wait a little bit before you find that perfect job. So take that opportunity to, to look around and, and see how a different position that you may not necessarily be happy about to apply for, but you can, you can still learn from that type of job. Um, I left academia whenever I got my master's degree and I worked in industry and I knew right off the bat that that's not exactly what I wanted to do, but I learned so much from that position. Um, it's, it's a whole lot different than just doing research in labs. You can work with lots of different departments and people and it really helped me to grow as a person and also to get the career that I'm in now, which I'm much happier. So in this economy, just be flexible. You can look around, even if you're not in a job that you're excited about completely, still work hard. You know, remain motivated, work as hard as you can. That's what's going to set you apart, and people will take notice. And remember, you're going to want people to write recommendations for you and to, to be a reference for you. So even if it's not something that you absolutely love, it may just be a couple of years, but it can help you down the road Besides that, I think mean, also because of this economy, it, a, a word of advice that I would give is find a way to, to separate yourself from the rest. You know, there's, from what I understand, when I was in the health sciences program, there were about 40 majors. Now there's 200. So it's growing. As you all probably know, ETSU is getting bigger. All colleges, I think, are getting bigger. They're growing. So you really have to find a way to set yourself apart from everybody else. And whether that be you know, really working hard on that resume so that whenever an employer looks at the resume, you stick out to them. Um, research, of course, the company, if you're going to apply for a company. Make sure that you put yourself a little bit above some of the others so that you have a better chance of getting that position. Thank you, ladies. I think that's some great advice. So, and the next question, what type of skills do you feel students should possess before entering the workforce? <laughs> well, of course, I think that it depends on the job that you want to apply for and the skills that you would want to have. I can only speak from my experiences and, um, of course, my preference is research and science. So. With that being said, the skills I have to pay attention to research that I need to have these days is, as I think it was Jan said earlier, bioinformatics is huge. I never believed that whenever I was getting my master's degree. I did take a bioinformatics course with Dr. Chakraborty, and at the time 
When your email is combining they can't see your facial expressions, they can't hear the tone of your voice, all they see is these words. So you lose a lot and you can make a lot of mistakes emailing. Um, you have to watch who all sends the email to. You have to watch, you know, how, you, how, how you're coming across. If you're mad when you get an email, give, give it an hour. You don't have to write back right then. Give yourself an hour and then come back and pull your notes apart. Even overnight, if you have to, you really don't know. Um, you know, give me some time before you respond to that email. Um, I think that will help a lot because of the challenges of email and uh, texting. How many people in this room text? I'm a big texter, tweeter, all those things. When you text and tweet, have you write? Acronyms, uh, shortened, truncated sentences. Well, when you're writing at work, you don't want to write like that. And in emails, you don't want to write like that. Text to your friend, but not in a work email. So I think that's going to be more and more challenging as we do more, more texting and things like that. We get used to that kind of grammar. And then when you go to try to translate, you can't remember how to spell stuff, quite frankly, because I have to use that word for so long. So I have to think for my spell checker on my word. And uh, I can just tell you that communication is important. And those are some tools that might help you. Um, one very last thing, if your email is like paragraph, paragraph long, pick up the phone call. You know, that's too much. You know, you might call them, give them a heads up, have a follow up more details in the email, but don't write a story in an email. It's a okay to call. Um, this is probably more applicable to the healthcare admin students. Um, how many of those are your jobs and graduates? Well, at least three of you will uh, get some more information.
crafting the text to ensure that they really take into consideration the effect of your words when the person's reading your email. Um, because there's a lot of implied meaning behind it, whether it's intended or not. So um, I think that's critical, and it's an easy way to get yourself in trouble. Yes. <laughs> Accidentally say what you didn't really mean to say. Um, and again, how to communicate appropriately with peers. And um, one thing I think that's probably, or I know, is, is critical where we have such a large variety of age groups, and um, you know, we've got very conservative folks and very liberal folks working together in the same environment. It's important to know what is appropriate for the work. And to, to ensure that your actions are respectful to all of those around you, um, you know, including those that may be older and have a different standard. Um, a lot of folks texting in a meeting is considered rude still. I, I find it rude. I'm not old, so um, <laughs> not. <laughs> The best decision I made 
was to stop goofing off and to actually put all of my heart in public health. And I did that in my choice of my field of And so I had to sort of do what Becca said in that I had to start, stop sweating the coursework, but get out of what I needed and then throw myself hard and all, you know, all into my field placement. And I did it, and it was the best decision I ever made. I enjoyed my field placement so much that it completely just confirmed everything that the four years have been leading up to. And it was awesome. And so I think that if you're going to choose public health, if, and obviously you are because you're a student in it, that you need to make sure that you get out of the coursework, what you need to. And when it comes time for that field placement or that project that's out in, to, out in the community that you've been assigned, you put everything you have into it because that's what you're going to be doing from here on out. And if you put all of yourself into it and at the end of it you think, well, you know what, maybe this isn't for me, that's okay. Because then you learn. You put all of yourself into it and you learn from that experience. But you've got to put all of yourself into it to figure out that this is what you want to do. For me, it was the best thing. It, it really just proved to me that my passion was exactly where it was supposed to be. And I knew that I wanted to do this the rest of my life. I wanted to be involved in public health practice in some form or capacity for the rest of my life. So putting all of yourself into your field placement, best decision I ever made. The best decision I ever made while at ETSU was along the same lines spoke to this a little bit earlier, was to set goals for myself that I thought were attainable and I thought would set me apart from other people that might be in my similar position. Um, in my particular case, this was to set the goal of publishing in the paper in the lab that I was working in. Um, when I was working on my master's, I was stuck for maybe four months <laughs> on, on a specific thing that we were trying to identify with the research that we were doing. We won't go into all the history details, but Anyway, I was stuck for about four months. I could have graduated. I'd done the coursework. I'd done plenty of research. But then the goal that I'd set for myself was to kind of publish the work that I'd done, and I wanted to complete what I'd started. So instead of just stopping after two years in the master's program, I just you know, decided to continue. Um, we eventually <laughs> figured out the secret to the mystery of what we were trying to determine with the chemical structure, and we got a publication out of it. And that's what really helped me in my career. You know, as far as I knew I wanted to be in the scientific realm, and for my particular job, you need to have publications. Um, again, if I wanted to go on to get a, a PhD, you really need to have publications or, or some way to show that you know how to do what you say you can do. So that was the best decision that I made. Surprisingly, we also had a lot of about 30 minutes starting at 8 o'clock. So before we get to that, do you guys have any additional comments or anything that you want to share that you want to get in touch on? I would just like to say that I'm very thankful for ETSU. They uh, really prepared me to go out into the workforce. I think we had a lot of uh, uh, practice with resumes and everything to help me get ready to go out into the workforce. I think through a lot of our projects, it helped me to be more self-motivated, like I mentioned earlier, at least they're procrastinating on projects. And it really um, made a difference in my career. Uh, also, seeing I'm more involved in the community uh, from things that I learned and, and functions that I did here at ETSU. It was a great school. We were in a great program, and it had a lot of, it had a lot of fun out in the community. So when you got there, I know it's best in the environmental health program that I deal more, more with, but when somebody from environmental health interviews and they went to ETSU, they're, they're almost a regular the job that they're interviewing at somebody from a different school. So uh, it definitely made a difference in my life. I'm thankful for you and all that you did to prepare me in my career. Something I think I, I was not aware of when I decided to go into public health, and to be honest, the reason I went into public health is I needed to hurry up and graduate. And at the <laughs> most, it's true. That's how I got my master's, but, but I needed. <laughs> It was the, the path of least resistance, but to the credit that I needed to graduate. And um, I was already working in infection prevention. And so it just made sense. It was a good fit, or so I thought at the time. Um, but I remember being worried that what if, what 
when I lose this job, I'm never going to be able to find a job that's meaningful. And in the last few years, as, as I've um, progressed with the time with others and so on, I realized that the field of public health is just so vast. And I don't think we realize, you know, I don't think what we talk about the, the type of stereotypical jobs that you get in public health, you know, the things we all think about. But there's, the field is expanding so quickly, and there's such a need for folks with the skill set that you guys don't have when you leave this program. Um, Dr. Weinhoff and I were talking this evening earlier about infection preventionists. We have three infection preventionists on staff at Mountain States that are public health graduates. Previously, that was only a job for our use. So with RNs, if you were lucky, a microbiologist would do the position. But, but never a public health person. And that's becoming much, much more common. They have public health folks at Wellmont now, and you know, it's, really becoming a trend because you guys have a unique skill set that's focused on those those things that that um, and process improvement and quality and so on. So um, get creative. When you're out there and you're looking for a job, you know, don't pigeonhole yourself into have to go work with the health department. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but get creative and, and really think, you know, there's quality in every health organization. There's a quality department and patient safety department nurse management department. And really you guys have a skill set that can that can get you in the door there. And once you're in the door, you know, you follow all of these tips with your, your skills and your toolboxes, you'll be a, a, a shoe in for the next step up. So. so one additional comment would just be that when your professors are assigning all of these um, projects are out in the community or what service based Take heed in the fact that they're doing it for your own good. They're not just doing it to tick you off and give you something else to do, like I thought they were doing at the time. Um, yeah, Dr. Seuss and Dr. Florence, the yeah, other still on my list. Um, but honestly, it, it's for your own good. And if you're in classes right now that don't have that, then seek out a service organization that you can be part of that gets you out into the community in which you want to work. I think that's one of the key things is that every student, and I know that the college is so committed to service and we're so lucky and unique in that regard, but if you still are not being fulfilled in your service heart, get out there and do it yourself. Um, one of the things that I did was, when I was working, and when I was working at the St. Thomas College, I worked at the gas station. Not much public health intervention that happens at the gas station I can speak to. So instead, what I did was I started volunteering I started volunteering at some nursing homes and some other things, seeking out those public health opportunities. And that was, go back to another great decision that I made, that was one of my great decisions, is to go out there and make sure that I was working with the people in which I was going to look for a job from. And getting into that and trying things on to see if they fit. So if you're involved, keep being involved. If you're not, seek out a service organization to be part of that you can go out and visit. The additional comment that I would have is similar to what the other ladies have had. Um, again, ETSU was a really great experience for me. You've got a lot of great professors that really care. Um, don't get discouraged. You know, if you have professors that push you, then listen to them. You know, they want the best for you. That's that's their job, and that's what I found. But I do see sometimes students will get discouraged a little bit, you know, and it's like they just want the best for you. They want you to be successful. So listen to them. Um, they have a lot of good advice, and they've been in your position before. The other thing I would say is put yourself out there. You know, work really hard. I tell my graduate students, if you're in grad school for two, maybe three years, or if you're in a doctoral program, maybe five years, that's only five years of your life. So in the grand scheme of things, that's not a long time. So work hard. Make that your focus. Um, set goals for yourself and try to fulfill those goals. And you know, work as hard as you can because then you have the rest of your life. Once you get a job to have fun and play and whatever you want to do, then you're successful as well. So if you go on to a master's program, then just work really hard during that program. It's not that long of a time, but it's long hours, it's tough, but it's totally worth it. Thank you, ladies. Um, so we're, now we're going to open it up to the audience. If anyone has any questions, if you'll just raise your hand.
very well prepared um, based on the curriculum that we were required to take. We did have certain electives, of course, that we could choose from, and that we had a decision to make. And so I think knowing ultimately where I wanted to do or where I wanted to go, um, having that freedom to choose some electives was good. But as far as the health sciences and the microbiology concentration, I think the curriculum was great. There's a lot of overlap, of course, with the chemistry department, the biology department. And so, in my particular experience, it was good to meet those professors as well and make sure that I was keeping up with those students also because there is so much overlap in disciplines. Um, but specifically, as far as the health sciences curriculum, there's not a lot I would change. It's very science heavy and a lot of organic chemistry and upper level biology classes, seminar classes, which really helped to prepare me for my career. So, I was extremely happy with the curriculum. One of the things that I, that got better from my BS to my MPH was the interactive components of classrooms. So I think that one of the things that I felt dissatisfied with my BSPH was um, the interaction uh, or the going through case studies or projects or um, group activities in the classroom. I felt some of them were more click and play kind of things. And that's changed, so it's great going from BS, um, BSBH to MBH. That was definitely something that had changed. I think that, and this is something that we've been talking about all night, but you guys haven't heard us talking about it since we did it before. But one thing that I had to really learn by myself, or thank goodness that I chose as elective microbiology, and I came from dad as a doctor, mom as a nurse, was when I got thrown out and I was a health educator, and so I had to communicate things about disease, I had to go and make sure that I understood what in the world that I, it was that I was communicating. So I think that um, the talks, the fact that the discussion is already open, that the curriculum will now have some more human health components um, is, is great because that was lacking. That was lacking. And I think that um, most people that are in public health that are not in administration even there, they're going to sit and have that need for human health, but especially health education, I needed it every single day, every single day. And so thank goodness that um, I like to read. So I, would, I actually went out and bought a biology book, I bought an anatomy book, and all that, and it's on my desk all the time, so that way I could go and look those things up. And so if right now you think that, so this is just another book too, so if right now you think that you you don't have the background in human health that maybe you should have and it's not going to be offered um, to you, go out and seek it because you will use it in everything you do in public health. Um, I would say definitely in my field, um, we definitely had plenty of science. And I think the curriculum, the curriculum was very good. I would like to have had a little bit of marketing and maybe business classes, especially in my master's. I chose the administrative option in my master's because of the position that I was in at the time. And I think that marketing and a little business can really help just uh, when you get out and have a little more leadership skills in that area. I think for the most part, the things that I would change have already changed. Um, Dr. White has been instrumental in making a phenomenal program. Um, I think probably the most important thing to change would have more been even the program, though. Um, you know, my focus certainly wasn't on school at the time. It was on hand mortgage and the kids and, you know, all of that. But um, I did seek out the community aspects and the building of relationships with my peers, and I wish I would have done that. I, I think that and certainly that's encouraged more now than it was when I was working on my bachelor's too. Um, but building those relationships because later on, I mean, there, there are a ton of people that work in health states alone that I went to school with. And um, it's almost kind of embarrassing. Like, oh, yeah, we were in classes together. <laughs> I never learned your name. But you know, so those, those relationships are important. And, and seek them out now while you're sort of all the same level playing field. 
Um, I, I think culture is a big, um, it's a barrier in a lot of ways for public health. And, and I'm speaking both within healthcare organizations and culture of communities and attitudes and so on. Um, what was the second part of your question? I forgot my memory. Oh, and, and, and that's why I thought culture. Um, because you folks coming out are going to have the skill set necessary to drive that culture. We know now what best practices in a lot of areas. Uh, a lot of healthcare organizations, though, still do things that aren't best practices, but we've always done them that way. It's that, that mindset of, we've always done it like this. You know, why, why a dang fix on work? It ain't broken. <laughs> <laughs> it's late. It's late, guys. <laughs> so, but, you know, you guys have that skill set. You've been learning these processes. Skills. We've been, been learning how to think in an innovative fashion and how to, to continuously improve um, and, and to use best practice to guide your decision making. And so I think that um, that's definitely something that not just public health, but you guys in particular can add. Very excited to meet you guys out in the workplace too. And while the environmental standpoint, I think one of the biggest environmental uh, challenges we'll be facing us in the next 10 years is like water, uh, clean drinking water. And you think of that in a third world country, you don't really think of it here in the United States, but there are already water wars going on. In Atlanta, uh, they have a lake there they get their water from. And a few years ago during the drought, they were almost without water. And so there's a big argument over the Tennessee River and whose it is and all this. So I think you'll be seeing a lot of issues with water and lack of it and finding clean water. So I think that's something that you all can be very influential with in uh, developing ways to treat water, um, you know, uh, developing ways to keep people safe and, and, finding, and finding water and, and safe in the water that they drink at the time. So I just think that's going to be a big issue in the next few years on the environmental front. So Ben got alluded to this talking about ACOs and the ACA and all of that coming down the pipe. So I think one of the biggest challenges right now is, as a public health professional, is seeing our place in the private health, starting looking more towards population health and the integration of primary care back to the main component of public health. So um, that's going to be huge. No matter if the health care bill stands or not, that's still going to be huge because the partners are going to have to come together if we're going to really start um, looking at the health of our nation, both public and privately. We're going to have to come together and get on the same, get the same sort of, get on the same course. Um, and so, what can you guys do to be ready for that? Is to know what that healthcare bill looks like. So that's self-service, considering I teach health systems. Um, but the biggest thing is to know what even those terms mean. So when I'm talking about primary care, when I'm talking about population health, when I'm talking about integrating those two, there are a lot of documents and reports out right now that you probably need to read as a public health student. And I will have some, um, there's lots out by the Public Health Foundation of going out and looking at those so that way you're ready. Because not only that, not only are you going to look at that it's going to affect your working life, but it's going to affect your personal life too. So seeing what where public health fits into all of this, since you're going to be practicing public health, is key. Oh, I just need to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Issues that we're facing today. Like I can understand, you know, 
our students do that, but I think it's good to have those skills. So ask, you know, ask the help with some of those kind of things too, instead of just staying within a certain box, you know, and, and sticking to what you think you might need to know, because you never know what skills you really could offer to a specific employer. We have time for one more question. Anyone has a question? Well, thank you all again for coming and for the alumni leave. We just have a small gift for everyone and for the college and also from the alumni association. Thank you guys for